You know, can God do the miraculous? I mean, did Jesus rise from the dead? So let's not have such a lack of faith that makes God so small that he can't do this. You know, he's either all-powerful or he's not. Today, we are kicking off a new series in Jonah, and it's probably going to be four weeks, and I know you're probably uh, skeptical, because often I give you a rough time period for how long a series is going to go, and they, and they kind of um, go way over that, but that's what I'm hoping to commit to. It's been a while, hasn't it, since we've done a series in the Old Testament? Has anyone noticed? Just me, good. We're going to read... Uh, all of chapter one in a moment, all of chapter one. But as always, when we kick off these new series, a little bit of background, I feel, helps us get a bigger picture. Jonah, if you didn't know, was a prophet uh, that we read about in, in the Old Testament. He lived in the northern kingdom of Israel under King Jeroboam II. It was probably, let's, if you think around that sort of 790, 800 BC times, so that's a long time ago, isn't it? We've still got the story today. God was working then, and it's part of his uh, word to us. But he was a prophet under this particular king. In fact, if we go to, oh, just to explain when I say northern kingdom, you know Israel eventually split in two. You know, they were a bit of a kingdom divided um, north, north and south. And so he was in that northern kingdom under this particular king. If you go back to Kings, 2 Kings, this is a bit of the story. Jeroboam II, the son of Jehoash, began to rule over Israel in the 15th year of King Amaziah's reign in Judah. Judah's the southern kingdom. He reigned in Samaria 41 years, Samaria being the capital of the northern kingdom. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to turn from the sins that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had Israel, led Israel to commit. So that's his, his dad. Jeroboam II recovered the territories of Israel between Lebo Hamath and the Dead Sea, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had promised through Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet, from Gath Hepha. How'd I go? <laughs> so we went back to 2 Kings just to get a tiny insight into the fact or, the, or the, the big picture of where Jonah comes from in the historical narrative of God's people, Israel. Jeroboam the second, though, if you missed it in the first slide there, was not a good king. At least not in the eyes of God. Perhaps he was in the eyes of some people. He did, not, he did have this, uh, I guess, sense of success. This was the king that got back some of our lost territory from the uh, Assyrians. You know, that, that feels good. He must be a good king, right? And yet, here's the author of Second Kings saying, he did evil in the eyes of God, you know, which is a good reminder sometimes about our idea of success and God's idea of success. You know what I mean? He got back the territory. You know, maybe we're heading back towards those golden years under David and Solomon. Feels right, and yet he did evil in the eyes of God. I can think one can assume based on those words alone, he did evil in the eyes of God, that if you were an appointed prophet in his time, maybe it's not a great season to be a prophet. You know, maybe it's a little bit difficult. Things aren't really being received well by the king at the time. So you've got to keep in mind, Jonah already had a hard job. So yeah, I'm asking you to have a little bit of sympathy for him straight up. <laughs> he already had a hard job. Let's assume he had his work cut out for him as a prophet to his own people, let alone what we're going to read God asks him to do in another land. Number two, the book of Jonah, it's written in a narrative style. We, we don't actually know who the author is, but you could assume it's either Jonah or he's, um, someone's writing it for him, you know, because he knows all of these details. And in chapter two, there's definitely a, a, 
a lot of reflection and, and, and outpouring to God, you know, personal. So you can say this is, this is Jonah's work. I think we can say that. Number three, Jonah is honest about himself. Imagine writing a book about yourself that people are going to be reading thousands of years later and it's full of all the things you did wrong. You know, who does that anyway? Usually when we write books, it's like, look what happened. Look what I did. Look what God did in my life. This is like, I failed. <laughs> God got a hold of me. And I love this about the Bible. You know, it's honest. It's honest. It's warts and all. It's, and sometimes we, like, we struggle with it. Good. You know, good. We, we should wrestle with, with um, the, words of, the word of God. It's not fake, you know, this, and, and it's important. All the way through to chapter 4, he writes honestly about his mistakes and even his bad attitudes. And ultimately, his story paints a picture of God's sovereignty, A, B, of his love for the whole world, not just the people that I thought he loved, my people, and the way God uses us to fulfill his purposes. And I've already given you most of my sermon today. <laughs> You know, there's important lessons to hear for us to learn about God and about who we are with him, you know, about ourselves. So I'm keen. Anyone with me? Yeah, good. So we'll kick off with chapter one today. Fair bit of reading. Let's get into it. The Lord, this is Jonah chapter one. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. Awesome. Who wants to go? But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket, went on board hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. I mean, that's pretty violent. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods, little G, for help, and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this? He shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused the terrible storm. Superstitious culture. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. I know, it sounds weird. You know, we don't do that. Yet. God used that, all right? It was part of his plan. Why has this awful storm come down on us, they demanded. Who are you? What is your line of work? And what country are you from? What is your nationality? Jonah answered, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. The sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. Oh, why do you do it? Did you do it? They groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, what should we do to you to stop this storm? Throw me into the sea, Jonah said, and it will become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. Instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get the ship to, land, to the land. But the stormy sea was too violent for them and they couldn't make it. And they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God, capital G. Oh, Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin and don't hold us responsible for his death. Oh, Lord, you have sent this storm upon him for your own reasons, for your own good reasons. Then the sailors picked Jonah up and they threw him into the raging sea and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Now, the Lord had arranged a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the side of the fish for three days and three nights. Is everyone familiar with this story? Most people, most of you will be. Can I just say, you know, particularly this last verse here, you, you can read this and think, 
kind of unbelievable. Especially this big fish part. Maybe it's just a, a really good story to prove a point or, or, or a principle for us to accept. Well, I, I don't see it that way. But Nathan, come on. Swallowed by a fish for three days. Seems far-fetched. Well, let me ask you, did God create the universe from nothing? You know, can God do the miraculous? I mean, did Jesus rise from the dead? So let's not have such a lack of faith that makes God so small that he can't do this. You know, he's either all-powerful or he's not. If he is, this miracle with the fish is nothing. That's easy. Same with Noah's Ark, same with the Israelites crossing the Red Sea, you know, escaping the Egyptians, all the things that people read and go, that, can't, that just seems unreal to me. Yeah, I know, because God can do things that seem unreal. He is God. Putting Jonah in a large fish is definitely within his power. And you know why else I think this is a true account? Because Jesus confirms it for us. When the religious leaders demanded a miraculous sign from Jesus to prove, you know, prove who you are, give us a sign, they would say to him. He pointed back to Jonah in the fish for three days of, of a sign of what was to come. This is Jesus. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And we know, rise again. I mean, you want a sign? There's a sign coming. But the point is, Jesus is basically confirming this story in the Old Testament reading today, it's real. You know, he didn't say that was a made-up story to make a point. He said that was, that was like a precursor sign, three days, three nights of what's to come. Three days. All that aside, there's a lot of lessons in the book of Jonah. And I'm going to give you some that I got. And I know that you could find your own if you would go and read it yourself, and I encourage you to do that. Here's the first thing. God calls his followers to be part of his mission. Now, you, you're probably not called to be a prophet. Although some are. You're probably not called to be a pastor, although some of you are and may have not yet responded. But you are called to play your part in his mission. In other words, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're called to be a missionary for the gospel. A missionary is simply someone who is sent to share the good news of Jesus. It turns out that's all of us, if you follow him. All of us. All of us. Yet there are different kinds of missionaries in different mission fields. And each one has a different calling and a different set of training and support. But everyone is in the mission. Jesus clearly said that his disciples, and, and that's all of us, if you follow Jesus, are called to be his witnesses. You know, we often say here at Hills Church, seed planters. We're in the mission field planting seeds. You've heard me preach that sermon, yeah? I love farming. We're all farmers for Jesus. We plant seeds. And in a sense, this gathering here today on a Sunday is the gathering of the missionaries to worship, to pray, to encourage, to teach, to have communion and baptize people and, and uh, fellowship together and drink coffee. All of those things are in the Bible. <laughs> and tea. <laughs> it's a backup plan. <laughs> and then... But then we go out into the mission field, don't we, during the week and plant seeds, you know, witnesses, loving people like Jesus did. Even when people are disconnected from God, even when people are, are, are going a direction in life that 
God's not calling them into that wouldn't be obedient to him. Like Jesus, we love everyone like missionaries. Because he said in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And, and if you follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in you and you have a power in you. The Holy Spirit. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We're all missionaries, all witnesses, where God has us. And for some, it's further afield. They go to Judea, you know, the surrounding areas from where they normally are. Or they go to Samaria, that's a bit further out again. This is the the areas that Jesus was talking about, where it starts, right? And I'm giving you the, the parallels for us. Samaria is that, it's that further outer region. And quite frankly, for the, um, the, the, the Jews hearing the story at the time, Samaria was like, a, that's not actually an area I want to go to, you know, those people. And Jesus said, no, you're going to be witnesses to the people that sometimes are hard to reach or that we have an issue with. You're going to be my witness. You're going to love them. The difficult places, that's the calling for some. And for some, it's the ends of the earth. And we've got people sitting here today who have been there. And we, we're praying for them most weeks as well. Our overseas missionaries, for example, you know, they, God said, get up and go, and they did. For most of us here today, it's here in our city. You know, Brisbane's like our, our Jerusalem there. When you go to work or to uni or to school, even in where you live, your neighborhood, your, your football club, running club, where it is that you, you're at, you will be his witnesses. In other words, people need to see Jesus in us. Planting seeds, loving people like Jesus did, but also there's times that we just have to tell them. You know, every year we pray, you will come forward and we pray, God, give us opportunities for that. To happen. It might even be as simple as an invite to Alpha. But for some, he's calling you to something different, perhaps even something harder than you think. Maybe even something you don't want to do at first, something similar to what happened to Jonah. And God said to him, get up and go. Go to Nineveh. How would you respond if you were kind of like happy with how things are going, where you're at? And you hear from God, get up and go. And we know what Jonah's response was. He got up and went the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. I don't know how that works since God is omnipresent. But he ran anyway. Before we're too quick to judge Jonah, uh, you need to know Nineveh, that he was called to, the place that he was asked to go to. It was, it was one of the main cities in, in Assyria, and Assyria was the enemy. You know, they're the ones that the king was trying to win territory back from. They invaded, they killed, they, they, take, they take the land. They're literally the enemy for the Israelites. There's probably a lot of hate going on, and you could understand it, couldn't you? If that was you, they're the guys that invade us. And God wants me to go to them. God, the one place I don't want to go, and you're sending me there. It'd be like saying to a Christian pastor or a missionary in the, in the Ukraine, I'm sending you to Moscow because I love the people of Moscow. If we jump forward to chapter 4 in Jonah, we find out this is exactly why Jonah ran because he didn't want his enemies to receive God's mercy, his love and mercy. So if we jump forward to chapter 4, we find out exactly that. Now, I'm giving away the ending a little bit, but we've got to understand this to get the big picture of what's going on from, the, from week 1. In chapter 4, all right, it's like a fast-forwarded time 16, you know, how you do that on Netflix or whatever it is, <laughs> and then you can't stop it. And anyway... So he complained to the Lord about it. This is after he got there, did what he was supposed to do, and God did what he was supposed to do. 
Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That's why I ran to Tarshish. I knew that you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You were eager to turn back from destroying people. He didn't want God to show mercy on his enemies. They harm us. They hurt us. We don't want good for them. You get it, don't you? We feel that way sometimes when people hurt us and harm us. That's not the people we want God to go in and help and show his compassion and mercy. After all the suffering you've been through. Anyway, there's a whole sermon on that one coming up, so stay tuned. Number two. We've got three with it as well. When God says go, we go. Perhaps someone's eternity is depending on it. Have you thought about it that way? Not to throw guilt on you, (laughs) but it could be. When he says go, we go. We can trust him to equip us. Those of you who have done this overseas, you've experienced this, right? We can trust him to provide for us. One thing I've discovered is that serving God in the way he calls me, actually, not only is it a privilege, even when it's really hard and, and, and you think I could run right now, but it's actually a blessing to stay in his will. Even the hard bits that he calls us to, even when it's excruciatingly hard at times. Now, I know Jonah's an extreme example, but are you listening to what God is calling you to? Are you moving? Or are you kind of running? Come back to that. Number three was supposed to be funny and it got revealed before I wanted it to. (laughs) You know, dramatic effect. It was gone now. But anyway, better to say yes than avoid fish guts. Oh, thanks. (laughs) Thanks, darling. If Jonah is a lesson in obedience to God's calling, there's a good chance he's going to get your attention somehow and get you there eventually. That's been my experience. I know this is an extreme example, but the lesson's there and it's good for us to receive. He'll get you there somehow. The journey to Tarshish on the ship is very interesting. I did know that he was not losing much sleep about the run. He was asleep in the middle of a storm in a ship. They're raging all around him. Everyone's panicking. He's having a sleep. He's good with his decision at that point. I guess God had to change that. When the crew finally wake him up, they're terrified. It dawns on Jonah, this is probably about me. Again, God's going, like the ship's going to get swamped. So what does he say? Remember this from verse 12. Throw me into the sea and it will become calm again. And I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. You think, oh, finally. He's, you know, there's contrition there. He's saying yes to God, but he's not. He's actually saying, I'll, I'd rather die than go to Nineveh. So he's not really at the right point yet. The next phase is kind of surprising because the non-believing, ultra-superstitious sailors don't do it. They don't kill him. You know, (laughs) I deleted this point this morning, but in a way, they're showing more compassion than he is. He's, He's a follower of God. He's supposed to know about compassion. He's not showing any compassion on the Assyrians that God's called him to. And here we got these non-believing, superstitious, whatever we call them, sailors, like, we're not going to kill him. There's, there's an example there for the church to be careful of. The chapter finishes with Jonah over the side of the ship. A big fish is sent from God. You know, we often assume it's a whale. We don't know. And that's where Jonah ends up. This is one of God's miracles. God never gives up on you, though, is my point. Number four there, number five in my notes. I don't know what I'm doing. Why didn't God give up on Jonah and just find someone else? Have you ever wondered about that? Okay, fine, mate. We're done. I'll get someone else. Too hard. You'd think he'd have a lot of options. He's God. 
How often do we see this when we read through the Bible? He doesn't give up, even when we make mistakes or go the wrong way. He doesn't give up on us. God loves us. He had a plan for Jonah. He believed in him. In fact, God needed him. Have you ever thought about that? God needs us. In one sense, he doesn't. And yet that's the way he's, he's set it up. He loves us. He needs us. He needs us. He believed in him. He wanted to partner with him in the mission to end sin and suffering. Because here's the thing. The message God wanted Jonah to give the, the Ninevites, it was a bit confronting when we read it before, wasn't it? You know, Here's the message I want you to give. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. You know, sometimes these Old Testament prophetic messages challenge us a bit. Have you ever asked why these Old Testament messages seem a little bit different to the New Testament ones? Do you ever ask yourself that? It's just me, obviously. Does anyone? Oh, good. All those warnings to the nations, including the Israelites themselves, change your ways. Cut out the sin. Get rid of the evil. Remove the corruption. Otherwise, as God, I have no choice but to end it. And it doesn't always feel like the God we know is, and it's just not true. God's operating out of a love for the world. Sin leads to evil and suffering. Sin leads to evil and suffering. Look around the world today. It's happening right before our eyes. In the Old Testament, God would warn whole nations over and over and over again, sometimes over decades. You guys have got to get it right. Stop doing it. I'm warning you. I've got to end this if you don't. Stop the evil. Turn back from the hate and the violence and the oppression that has infiltrated your nation. Why? Well, one of the reasons, I believe, is because generation after generation will continue to suffer if if it doesn't stop. You stop it or I will. Sin is serious. It's not just about displeasing God. Sin leads to evil and destruction and suffering in people that God loves. So he can't ignore it. Doesn't sound very loving. He can't ignore it. People will continue to suffer. This was the message of repentance in the Old Testament. And that's all he was asking. Repent and come back to my ways. Let the suffering end. Change your ways. and There is a judgment. Yes, animal sacrifices were then needed to atone for sin because sin is punishable. It has to be. The Old Testament way of atonement was different and difficult. And so God promised a new way. And the New Testament message therefore feels different and in some ways is. God's justice and judgment of sin remains except the message to the world now is Christ crucified for our sin. Now it's repent and believe and Jesus takes on that judgment through a free gift of grace. We've been singing about it this morning. His atonement is now perfect because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice and therefore it's secure for us and forever. A new covenant. It's like new wine in new wineskins. Well, Jonah was part of God's plan to save the world, and so are we. We're asked to join him and tell the world about the message of hope in Jesus. Just take that back a step. For Jonah, the loving, patient, forgiving God, led him back and got him back on track with God's plan. And it all happened. The Ninevites repented, and it actually changed them. We're going to read about that when we get to chapter 4. It actually changed them. That city that was going, going down the wrong path, the enemy city, actually hears the message 
And as we read, God's mercy flowed to them. His compassion flowed to them. And if you've been running from God's will or his calling, I want you to know that he's not given up on you, but you've got to avoid the fish guts and say yes. He is the God of second chances. Maybe it's time to stop running and just get up and go. This morning, we're going to have a time of prayer. And if you've been discerning something in your life God is calling you to, then the prayer team will pray with you about that. How do I get up and go to something that I don't want to do? Or maybe you yourself, the calling is actually to to get up and come to Jesus and stop fighting that one. Just go to him. Receive that gift of grace and his mercy and his salvation for you. I'd love to pray for you for that as well. And I'm going to be at the front for a little while after we close. Would you stand with me? It's a long journey to go in Jonah yet. But don't, don't wait. You know, don't wait. What do you think God's calling you to do in your life? Is there that person at work or uni that's your Samaria or your, your Nineveh and, and, and you just don't want to do it? You know, is that, is that real for you? Or in your family? I don't, want to, I don't want to do anything for that person. They hurt me. And you run. You run from what God's calling you to. Maybe the better title for today would have been, uh, you know, where's your Nineveh? Or who's your Nineveh? So let's pray about it. Thank you, God, that you love us. Thank you that you didn't give up on me when I did some running. You're so patient and gracious and kind and forgiving. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, what are you calling us to now? What's the hard thing that we would run from? And so we... We want to have open hands, Lord, this morning. We want to be obedient to what you're saying to us because you know best. You know best. You are our God after all and we are your people. And I just pray that we, you'd help us clearly hear your voice today. And I think, Lord, we need to also say for the times that we've run, we want to say sorry. Forgive us. You know, we sing it all the time, that our, you know, build our life and our life is in your hands, all those, all those really awesome lyrics. We need to mean it. It's not about me, yet not I, but Christ in me. There's a whole world out here, Lord, that seems to be falling apart at the seams and you're crying out for your people to show the way, to spread compassion and love and mercy and to turn people away from the old life of darkness and death and sin to a new life, Lord, in you, a new life in Christ, a new a life made new in you, a life in the light. We, the church, have to do this. Even here in our Jerusalem, in our city of Brisbane, we need to be your witnesses. And so I pray even as we leave this gathering of missionaries this morning, Lord, that 
you would empower us with um, the sensitivity and the, uh, the compassion that you have, but Lord, also the boldness we need. I pray for that for us all, every single person standing here as we leave today. Show us how to just love people first. And may they see you in us. I pray that in the name of Jesus.